All right, this morning, uh, the message is going to be on Psalms 11. If you want to go ahead and turn your, your Bibles, Psalm chapter 11, and actually I'm just going to be really focusing on one verse, and then we'll come back and read the rest of the psalm at the end, and there's only seven verses in, the, in Psalms 11. So I just want to pray over it again. Lord, we just thank you for your word, and, and Lord, just for the richness of it, what you're speaking to us, and, and Lord, we just ask that you give us revelation and understanding and application to our lives, and Lord, we just thank you that we have the privilege to have your word. That's for your help, for your anointing, just for your quickening, for clearness, to articulate your heart, give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in context, this, this is a psalm of David, and, and basically it's a psalm where uh, scholars really don't know whether it was where uh, Absalom was after him trying to kill him or whether it was Saul, some period in his life where he was being chased and, and his life was in danger. But that's not the application I want to look at this morning. I want to bring it to, uh, to May 9th, 2021, and ask the question, what does this say to us today as a nation, as people, as a church body? And the focus is going to be verse 3. So I'm just going to go ahead and start there. And it says, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. Uh, the only difference I saw, like in the ES, uh, English Standard Version, and the NAS, was that they said, if the foundations are destroyed, but the rest of it was the same. But I did look up a couple other out of uh, the Message and also the Passion Bible. I always try to encourage people, first, first of all, you know, I use some of those, but it's good to get a, a, a word-by-word uh, interpretation of, you know, like in this case from the original Hebrew or Greek from the New Testament before you go to uh, one of the paraphrases because you're getting the, you know, the author's opinion sometimes on that. And sometimes it's very helpful and it gives good information, but it is an opinion. But the, the Message Bible says, the bottom dropped out of the country, good people don't have a chance. Let me read that again. The bottom drops out of the country. Good people don't have a chance. Now the Passion Bible says, what can the righteous accomplish when truth's pillars are destroyed and law and order collapse? What can the righteous accomplish when the truth's pillars are destroyed and law and order collapse? Lap. So as we think of our nation, we think, okay, what are the pillars, what is the foundation of our nation? Well, governmentally and politically, it would be the Constitution, right? Culturally and morally, it would be our Judeo-Christian moral values, uh, morality that has been with us for over 200 years. But what happens when those foundations are being destroyed? And it asks the question, what, what can the righteous do? So what happens is truth becomes a lie, and a lie becomes truth. You know, I remember back in high school having to read the book 1984. Probably many of you had to, had to read that back in school days. And one thing that always stuck with me was that their uh, department or ministry of propaganda was called the Ministry of Truth. You know, the Ministry of Truth. And so we have much media today and, and that are... Again, expressing saying it's truth when there's not really truth around it. You know, Goebbels, who was the, uh, the Nazi leader of the propaganda department of the uh, Nazis, he said, if you tell a lie often enough and long enough, it becomes truth. 
And I think that's what we have to begin to watch for and see what's happening in our nation. If you tell a lie long enough and hard enough, it will become truth. Now, one of the problems that happens, especially as we talk about the, the end times, and this is kind of an end time, uh, besides its actual context, it's kind of an end time uh, psalm, as well as Psalm uh, 2. But one of the hallmarks of end times will be deception. So I want us to go to uh, Matthew chapter 24. It's a famous, well-known scripture regarding the end times. I want to look at that. And we'll look at verses 4 through 14. Though actually, I think I'm going to go back farther. Let's go to the, well, let's go back to the very end of chapter 23 because it all ties in. There wasn't, you know, obviously chapter divisions at this time. But Jesus is speaking. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And starting verse 1 to 24 it says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when the disciples came up to him and called his attention to the buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now that had to be a shock to the disciples to think, what? The great temple where we worship, where we praise, where God has set his throne, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now they're thinking they're asking one question, but really they're asking two questions, two different time frames. Because the first time frame was going to happen in 70 AD when the, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the temple, and over a million Jews were killed during that time. The other part of it has to do with what we refer to as the end times or the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said, watch out that no one deceive you. So here we have that emphasis again upon deception. Watch out that no one deceive you. For many will come in my name claiming that I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now, there in verse 5, a lot of times we think of that as false Christ, people who say they are the Messiah and they come and deceive people. That's one interpretation, but there's another way. It can also be that, yes, they will say that Jesus is the Messiah, but will still lead people astray into a false gospel. You will hear of wars and rumors of war, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. We've talked about birth pains before, how as they begin to come on a woman, how their their contractions are mild at first, and there's a longer time between them. And as time goes on, their contractions become more often and more intense. Verse 9, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and to be put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, 
the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So as it says at that time, there will be many who will turn away from the faith. Now the good news is, it says the gospel will be preached in all the nations. And we are coming to a point now, I know where the um, Wycliffe Bible translator are getting to the place within a few years where every they will have a, a Bible word of God in a, their native language uh, last I heard it was within five years so every people group every different language group would have the gospel that'd be part of it and also preaching the fullness of the kingdom of God that the word would go forth to all the nations now one other scripture I want to look at is second Timothy chapter 3, just two little verses there. Just to see, show you again that uh, deception again is one of the main hallmarks of the end time. Second, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3. I just want to look at verses 12 and 13. It says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So those who are being deceived will be deceiving and being deceived themselves. So deception, again, is one of the hallmarks of end times. Now, the funny thing about deception is if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived, obviously. The other point is that deception brings persecution because if if you're not deceived those who are deceived will be persecuting and so what that creates within uh, the church or within any Christian organization or your own life it will create pressure to compromise to pivot uh, a couple weeks ago Jerry Nash gave me this article out of a magazine, Christian magazine, and it's by Albert Moiler, who is the, uh, he is the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And he's talking, the, the topic was, and the title of it is Pivoting to Surrender, a warning for all Christians. And he's talking about, there's a Christian uh, adoption agency, one of the largest ones in the nation, uh, and they're nationwide, and they're called Bethany is the name of it, so you get this. But I'm just going to read part of it. He says, Bethany here refers to Bethany Christian Services, which has been one of the nation's largest evangelical agencies involved in adoption and foster care. The pivot point to its policy was regarding LGBTQ issues. Bethany recently announced that it would now place children in same-sex households with other family identified as LGBTQ. This can be only described as a watershed pivot, a pivot away from Orthodox biblical Christianity and towards the aim of the sexual revolution and its new morality. Make no mistake, this is exactly the pivot that is increasingly demanded by the moral revolutionaries. They will not relent until every operational commitment to Orthodox Christianity, understanding of marriage and sexuality is eradicated from the public square. This means that every institution, school, ministry, denomination, and individual who would participate in marketplace must cap capitulate their beliefs. Bethany surrender exemplifies the growing culture pressures from the LGBTQ community and the looming threat of the Equality Act. The moral revolution is now firmly established in the Democratic majority in Congress and the White House, where President Biden is proudly leading the charge for what are presently as LGBTQ rights, but would actually mean a near total restructuring of society. The consequences is a legislative agenda designed to coerce 
Americans into the celebration of the LGBTQ agenda. And what happened was there were several different major cities like Philadelphia, there were states like Massachusetts that basically came to them and said, you're going to have to either shut down your operations or open it up uh, to anyone, whether same-sex couples or whatever. And so because of that pressure, they ended up changing what they have historically done in the past. It was either that or begin to close in certain cities or states. And it goes on and says, um, Bethany Christian Services buckled under the pressure, try as they may to walk a tightrope. There is no middle ground between the moral rev revolution and biblical orthodoxy. Christians must understand this. Pressure is mounting on all fronts and will confront every single Christian institution, school, co congregations, denominations, and ministries. And he says, every Christian and every Christian ministry will come to a reckoning, and we must all decide here and now where we will stand. Will we pivot, or will we hold fast to the faithfulness and the hope of the gospel? Let me be clear where I stand. <clears throat> I and the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary stand. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The demand to pivot will undoubtedly come, but we will not surrender before the fight. We see the fight through all the way to the end. If we have to leave the buildings to the bats, so be it. We will shut it all down before we surrender our commitment to Christ, to the gospel, and to the unfailing truth of God's word. By God's grace, this is where we stand. We're about to find out which institutions, schools, churches, and denominations will stand and who will pivot and abandon the faith. So that's what's happening in our world, and that's the pressure that is coming. I also just this week saw an article, I think it was Wednesday, about a, uh, a former interior ministry. Uh, she uh, used to be in the government in Finland, and she's also leader of the Christian Democratic Party there, which is one of their political parties. And she has been criminally charged with hate speech for posting a picture of the Bible open to, uh, open to Romans 1, verses 24 through 27. And she did that in response to the church, which she's a part of, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, participating in an LGBTQ event. Now that tweet and that picture that she sent could put her behind bars. So she is being charged with, with hate speech. So let's just look at that while we're there, Romans chapter 1. Look at that scripture that she posted. And she didn't make any comments. She just <clears throat> let it speak for itself. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> In verse 24 through 27, <clears throat> it says, Therefore God gave them over into the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committing indecent acts with other men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. So because she showed a picture of that, again, she's being charged with hate speech. And so that pressure is coming, and it's, it's taking the form of persecution, and we should expect that that persecution is coming to us. That's one thing, again, that the Word of God promises us. There will be persecution. 
But he asked the question, okay, what can the righteous do? If, the, if things are being changed, if we're, if we're seeing our Constitution, the foundation being broken, if we're seeing uh, our moral values being destroyed, where you cannot stand for biblical morality, what do we do? Well, one thing, we have to stand. We don't compromise. We don't pivot. But there's going to be great pressure to do that. There may be a time where they say, you either do it or we will shut you down. And then we'll have to make that decision that we walk away. But one thing we can do is go back to Matthew chapter 7. Because what the righteous can do is make sure that we're in a place that we're on that sure foundation. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. And Jesus tells them, he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, he is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the, steam, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because he had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew, and they beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So one thing we do, we build our house upon the solid rock of Jesus upon his teachings, upon the word of God. And it says that, you know, the rain's going to come, the wind's going to blow. So those storms are coming. We're not going to be able to prevent the storms from coming, but we will be able to stand intact after the storm comes by those who do not will see their house destroyed. You know, John, you don't need to turn there, but John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, uh, In this world you will have tribulation or you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we take heart in that. Yes, we are going to have, even in the best of times, there's trouble. You know, you have situations, you have things that come up. But take heart, he says, for I have overcome the world. In other words, we need to always keep our mind on the big picture, what's going on. Isaiah 9-7 says, and it's a prophecy about, uh, Isaiah makes about the Messiah, about Jesus coming, and it says, There will be no end to his government or of his peace. So despite what's going on here, despite what we may see, in our own nation and in our own lives, there's no end to the expansion and the growth of the kingdom of God. Now let's go back to Psalms chapter 11. Let's read the, the rest of it. And I think we also have to be careful that many times we, you know, we kind of have this attitude that, well, you know, we're, we're Americans. You know, it's not going to happen here. And so much it's like, uh, it's like the Jewish people of that day of 70 A.D., they kept saying, no, can't happen with temples here, temples here. It can't it never happen here. And it happened there. And so we, we have to realize that we're a kingdom of God, that we're, we are... Sojourners, we're, you know, this is not our home. And while we love our country and while we ask for the best and we pray for it, we also have to realize that there comes a day where if it turns in the wrong direction, if it doesn't come back, that we are in a, in a place where it's, it's uh, like the drain, you know, you, you drain the bathtub and we're heading, we're heading down that slope. 
But Psalms 11, let's start with verse 1. First thing is, it says, In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountain? So the first part was that we all need to always make sure that, that our place, our refuge is in the Lord. It's like the Psalms 91. We are under the shadow of his wings, that we're in that place, that we're, uh, other scriptures will give us thing of being abiding in the vine, abiding in the Lord, abiding, spending time with him growing in him and realizing that that's where our source comes from. If we take refuge in him, he is our refuge. Verse 2, for, the, for look, the wicked bend their bows, they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. So the enemy is going to be shooting arrows at us, or accusations is going to be persecution in whatever different form it comes. But we remember that we're taking our refuge in the Lord. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, verse 4 says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. So despite what's going on here, what we see, it hasn't changed God a bit. He's still on the throne. He's still in heaven. He still is sovereign. He observes the son of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. So in that verse 7, we take comfort in the fact that, that he loves righteousness and he loves justice. So even though injustice may reign for a while, ultimately justice will reign. We might suffer injustice, but we also will be rewarded. Now, there's one more psalm I want you to look at, just the first five verses of Psalm 2, because it's a companion to Psalm 11. And it also, as I said, it's, it's really an end-time psalm. And verse 1, Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations conspire, and the peoples plot in vain? Okay, so the, the nations are conspiring, they have purposes, they have plans, and this is talking about against the Lord. Verse 2, the kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now this is what they say, verse 3, let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. In other words, throw this off. Throw off anything that inhibits my pleasure. I'll decide what is right and what is wrong. No one's going to tell me what is right and what is wrong. If I want to marry a horse, I'll marry a horse. There's no stopping point to it. And so that's what they're saying is we're going to break off the fetters. We're going to break off those things that are keeping us from having the full expression of what we think would be good. But the good news is verse 4. And it says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. He laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. All their plans and all their purposes, he laughs and he goffs at them. And then he rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. So despite what the, 
the world and the kingdoms of this world as we become, especially as we get closer and closer to the, the end times. You're going to see more and more of a rebellion against the things of God, against what he says is truth, what he says is right, and what he says is wrong. And it comes as you get into Revelation and you begin to read, you see that even when they get to the point where the, the kings, the nations, those who are rebelling against God, even though they know it is God who's pouring out judgment upon them, they refuse to repent. They shake their fist, even though they know there's no, you know, ambiguity at all. They know it is God is bringing judgment, and specifically above the of the Antichrist and his kingdom. This is when the one world government is in place, and even though they know that, they will still resist the Lord, even when they know He is the one who's bringing judgment upon them. Their hearts are so hardened at that place. So as we begin to see more and more of these things begin to unfold and we begin to see more pressure coming, in each of our lives we need to make a stand. For one thing, you need to know what the book says. You need to be in the Word so that you know where you're standing on, that you are standing on the rock. You are standing on what is truth. As Jesus said, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. And we stand on what he says is, is right and what is wrong. We stand on the Word of God, that throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, of the things he has taught us. But we're coming to that place where there's going to be, have to be decisions made. And unfortunately, it says that many will turn away. And that's hard for us. But we have to stand faithful to the end knowing that there comes a point in whether this, whether this thing is turning around and we're going to see maybe a revival, a change in leadership, something happens that turns our nation back, which is what we're praying for. We're asking for God to intervene, to change, to bring a revival for the church, to bring a great awakening for this nation and turn it all around back to our godly foundations. And, you know, I've listened to some different prophetic voices saying, you know, that's going to happen and this is going to be turned and very quickly off president's going to change and all these things. But as I look at it, I just, it looks to me from the signs, as you look at the signs, the times, that we may have a revival and a great awakening, but I think at the same time, we will have very hard times to go through. And it's not one or the other, it's, it's both. You know, I was uh, listening to a message that Mike Bickle had given not long ago, and he was talking about he had had, you know, in his 50 years of ministry, I think he said he, he's had two open visions. And one open vision was in 2008, and he saw tanks, foreign tanks in our cities. Now, the second one was actually this year, March 3rd, and it was a door, it was like a door in heaven that opened, and there was just glory and light, meaning where the Lord is, is, is in Revelation saying, hey, I stand at the door and knock, and it's opened, and the glory, which would, which would mean a revival, which would mean a, a great awakening, which would mean God's power being, being manifest. And so it's like, okay, well, which one is it? I mean, because in a way, it seems they're opposite. And I think it's both. It's in the context of, of hard times, of, of disruption, of storms, that the Lord moves mightily, and we see a great revival coming. So our part is to stay in the fight, to keep pressing in, believing God, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, you know, Luke 4, 18, the move of God, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us to do miracles, healing, to see the kingdom grow because his kingdom never stops. It's continually growing despite persecution. But at the same time, we need to expect that things could get pretty rough for us. 
it may be a point where we're going to have to make decisions where we're going to stand and what we are willing to lay down and give up. But that God always has a purpose and a plan. You know, the church in China has been under persecution for since the late 1940s. And they went underground. And, you know, there's more believers in China than there is the United States, even though they're being persecuted. So we may come to that day. So we all need to be thinking, asking the Lord, okay, what does that look like? What happens as this thing continues down the path that we're going? What does that look like? The church may be in your house, your friends, people you know. And if that is what happens, that's what's happened. We'll, we'll deal with it at that time. But I do want to just, again, just be a kind of place of a sober realization that, that we're in uh, troubling times. And I don't see a lot of turnaround happening except spiritually. I think the persecution is going to increase uh, but we will stand and we will let our light shine during those times. So let's go ahead and stand. We're going to have a song again at the end. We'll worship song. And I just want to again just have people who, uh, whatever your need is, if you need a touch from the Lord for your body, a, a physical touch, we need to increase our expectation that the Lord is going to move. Or that you may have a, a prophetic word for someone. We need to, to be open to the Spirit begin to move through us to minister to one another. So let's just wait a couple minutes on the Lord. Open your hearts. So, Lord, we just come right now, Lord, saying, Lord, we're your children. Lord, you said you would never leave us or forsake us. You would not leave us as orphans, Lord. We say our refuge is you. And we say, come, Holy Spirit, work through your people. Lord, I ask that you would release words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Lord, I ask that that gift of prophecy. Lord, those gifts of healing. Lord, that gift of discernment. Lord, for tongues and interpretations to begin to flow through us as a congregation. Lord, we have no desire to, to lean upon the arm of the flesh. It's not our ability, Lord, it's, it's you working through us. As, as Paul said, in my weakness, your strength is revealed. So, Lord, I ask that you begin to move through this congregation, that each person, Lord, that you begin to stir hearts. Lord, as only you can do. And we wait to you, Lord. We say, Lord, come. Come, Lord. Come, help us in our weakness, in our frailty. Lord, in our failings, when we fall, help us to get back up and get in the game, Lord. Lord, you says that a, a righteous man falls seven times, but you are faithful to bring him back up. So, Lord, despite our, our stumbling and our, our mistakes that we make and our failures that we make, Lord, we're looking to you Asking, Lord, that you would do a work within us, Lord. Through us, to us, Lord. We just say, Lord, we are desperate for you. We need you, Lord. There is no substitute, Lord. We've got to have your manifest presence, Lord. Because we do ask, who can stand in a day like that? It's through your strength, your grace, your empowerment. So, Lord, we're waiting upon you, saying, Lord, here we are. We're just presenting ourselves before you, asking that you would do a work. Help us, Lord. Give us insight. Give us wisdom beyond what we know in the natural, Lord. Begin to move in our midst, Lord. Because in times like this, Lord, where you said to rise and shine, let our light shine, Lord, we need everything that you have for the human heart. Every gift we want in our tool belt, Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear what's going on in our own lives, in the lives of this nation. Teach us how to respond. What is our response to be? 
How do we answer someone? How do we speak the truth in love? Lord, we have lots of questions. But Lord, we know you have a lot of answers. So Lord, we're waiting on you. Come, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Refreshing your people, Lord. Lord, your word says that you would bring times of refreshment from the Holy Spirit. We need those times of refreshing. We say, come, Lord. Come powerfully in our midst today. We're looking to you. Our eyes are on you, Lord. Meet us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Have your way with us, Lord. We listen for that still, small voice to speak. Lord, we want more of those things, just as as Steve Sherman testified this morning, where you speak to that individual, Lord. We want to be listening. We want to be open with you. We say, come, Lord. We want that relationship with you, that personal one-on-one time with you, Lord. We want to know your voice. We want to hear your voice. Lord, your word says your sheep hear your voice. So, Lord, unstop our ears, Lord. Settle our minds that we begin to hear your voice clearly. Remove the distractions. Prepare us, Lord. We're longing for you. We want more, more love, more power, more of you in our lives, Lord. Come, Lord. Lord, I just pray for your blessing over this people, for your grace, for your leading, for your guiding. I ask, Lord, that you put a hunger in their hearts for you, a hunger for, their, for your word, a hunger to spend time with you in prayer, just one-on-one with you, Lord, to pour out their hearts, Lord. To pour your heart out to the Lord. To develop that relationship. That relationship is a one-on-one relationship. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. And he's wanting that relationship with you. But like a marriage, you have to work at that relationship. You have to spend time. The Lord caused that hunger to arise. Caused that desire to even seek you. 